Okay, so we're going to be talking about ELF today. Um, originally, this was titled Introduction to ELF, but I felt that was kind of insulting because this, these slides contain way more than like introductory level of knowledge, at least I feel they do. So I was going to name the, I was going to name the slides um, ELF on a shelf, but I felt like that was even more insulting, so <laughs> we're just going with ELF. Um, yeah, and fun statistic, like 80% of this research was done in the week before spring break. And then the other 20% was done between the hours of like 9 p.m. last night and noon today. So, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's get the show started. Okay, on with the circus. So what is an ELF? It's an acronym for Executable Linkable Format. And that acronym is really cool because, you know, ELFs. And that's about as cool as the naming conventions for, this things, for these things are gonna get. It's just all downhill from there. You'll see what I mean. But yeah, an ELF is pretty much just compiled code for Linux systems. Um, you can think of it as like an EXE, but Linux sort of sometimes because it's not always executable. But like execu executable files on Linux systems are elves. Um, that's another thing. Like, should I, should the portal be elves with a V or just elf S? I don't know. <laughs> I'll just rotate between the two. We'll see what sticks. But uh, yeah, it's compiled code on Linux, elves. If you ever ran LS, you ran an elf. It's all just elves. But, uh, like the goal of these slides is presentations to find out what's actually in there, um, what's happening, and to kind of look behind the curtains. All right. So here are some useful tools for looking at elves. Um, object dump, it disassembles stuff. Read elf, it just parses elf files. And I use Radari 2 as well because sometimes read elf wasn't really being truthful to me, and we'll get into that. Um, yeah, and Radari 2 is just like a decompiler, debugger. It, has a bit of a learning curve, but it's really cool. Okay, so let's start nice and slow. What are the types of ELF files? We have relocatable ELF files, the ETREL files. They're also known as object files. These are the files with .o extensions. Um, they're position independent code. They hold you know, data and code, and you link them into executables. So if you have like a bunch of these .o files, you can combine them together to get like an actual executable file. Uh, you have executable files, which are executable. Um, you have shared object files, which are dynamically linkable. So like the uh, regular just object files, they are statically linked. Um, unless you, you know, do some hijinks, but they're typically statically linked. Whereas a shared object file is going to be dynamically linked, so kind of like modular type stuff linked at runtime. If you like wrote a kernel module, it's that kind of idea. It's just a... Uh, kind of more more modular way of linking things, so you don't have to like recompile and st statically link everything all the time. Uh, yeah, okay. So this is the general structure of an ELF file. Um, there are two kind of perspectives to look at it from. Yeah, the linking perspective and the execu execution perspective. Uh, both perspectives are really just kind of looking at the same data, not really, the same kind of spaces of data, but just a different presentation of it. Um, yeah, so like the linking view is for when, if you're, when the thing is getting linked. So if you look at there, it says the program header table is optional. We'll get into that, but it's optional because the program header table is not necessary for execution. So when you're looking at it from the linking view, really you just need the section header table because that tells you where all the sections are, which comes into play when you're linking. Whereas when you're looking at it from the execution view, you're executing, you need the program header table because it describes the segments which kind of describe how to execute the file, right? So that's kind of how that works. Um, same, but not really, just different kind of presentations of the same kinds of areas. And a kind of a helpful way to look at it, but don't take it too literally, is to think of it as like the segments sort of contain sections, even though that's not really what they do. But if you think of the sections in terms of what segments they're in, then it, it helps. All right. So. We'll start at the top of that, right? Like if you look at here, you start with the elf header at the top. So yeah, we'll go and we'll go top down. We'll start with the elf header. It's kind of like the roadmap of the file. Um, there's a lot of stuff there. You don't have to worry about what all those things do. There's no point in going through all of them one by one um, for the purposes of this presentation. I mean, you can, and I did. <laughs> but um, it's pretty much just like a way of mapping out the rest of the file. The elf header is gonna say, okay, you know, what arch, what architecture is it meant for? And then that's where you find that information. 
Um, where's all the different header tables? Or where are all the string tables? How big are they? How many things do they contain? Uh, that kind of stuff. So this gets referenced uh, a lot when you're doing like parsing or when the other sections, they kind of sometimes pull data from here to, um, to get all the data that they need, the information that they need for whatever it is that they're doing. Um, yeah, oh, and also, so you can see that this is like the C struct of it, right? At the bottom there, you see it's, in, um, the struct is the elf32 e header. So I'll be pulling examples from both 32, like elf32 and elf64. They're mostly interchangeable. Um, so, like, it shouldn't matter too much depending on what you're doing. They're, like, pretty much exactly the same with some minor differences, but nothing too crazy. Uh, all right. The elf header. So this is how you would parse it in C. I was kind of like writing a little parser proof of concept thing to figure this stuff out. I felt like it could be kind of help, helpful to look at. Um, I named it Theanor. If you understand that reference, then you're a pretty cool person. If you don't understand that reference, then you're probably healthier of mind <laughs> and more uh, affiliated with the texture of grass. Okay, so um, let's see here. Yeah, we first kind of just start you know, we create a UN8 porter, a, uh, a pointer. We just call it mem, why not? We map that to the file descriptor, FD, that, and that argument is the, the elf that we're gonna be looking at. We map it to memory, and then um, we first had to find out the architecture of this thing. The way I'm doing that is checking the, uh, the magic bytes, which are like the first, um, the first few bytes of the file. You can look at them, the, uh, the fourth byte will tell you whether or not it's 32. Well, it will tell you if it's 32 bit or 64 bit. If it's 32 bit, it'll be set to one. If it's 64 bit, it'll be set to two. So you you know find out whether it's 32 bit or 64 bit, and once you know that, you can go through and parse the rest of it. Um, you would have to like this over here. This bullet point. Well, can you see that? Okay, cool. You can. Um, this will tell you. This is pretty much just saying, okay, create a e header struct. We're using elf32. If it's 32 bit, right? And just cast that memory pointer that we made earlier, just cast that to an elf header. And then once you have that, once you have your elf header, you can grab all the different, um, the different fields of it by just, you know, elf header dot or like arrow e entry and the rest of the things. Um, yeah, so just kind of what that looks like in C, right? So if you go back here, all of these values, you can just pretty much find them by getting them like that. Okay. So that's the ELF header. Now we're going to go into the program header table, which again, the linking view, it is optional, but this is pretty much required when you're looking at it from the executional perspective, right? So the program header table is an array of program headers, program header structs, and we'll look at what those look like later. But um, each one describes a segment. So what is a segment? It is a way of organizing and labeling sections of code slash data that is useful for loading it, right? So it's just kind of like a labeling mechanism, kind of, and a way to organize stuff. And it, they come in different types. You have some of the more common types, right? PT load, loaded to memory. There's always going to be at least like one of these in, in ELF. Um, and these come in like two flavors. It's kind of like a data segment and a text segment. And just kind of keep those in mind. I'll get to those like more in depth later. You have the dynamic uh, type, which is for dynamically linked executables. Contains lots of information regarding re relocation entries and those things. We'll get into that. Um, you have note, a place for vendors to ensure you know, data compa compatibility for whatever software they're writing. Um, there's some cool introduction techniques, some malicious things you can do with that one that I have yet to look into, but I know they exist, so that's there. Um, PT interp holds the program interpreter. It's just like your, you know, Linux LDSO or whatever that's gonna be used to interpret the program. Um, and then you have the PT program header, which is just the program header table itself. It just contains the location and size of it, some metadata. All right. So that's what the struct looks like. So remember, the program header table is just going to be an array of these structs. Again, this is an ELF32 example. And uh, yeah, it's got a little descriptions there next to each, what, what those things do. 
Um, it just describes the type, um, which again, uh, whoops, that's all the way back, which describes these things, right? These are the types. Um, and then, you know, kind of different ways to find it and where it's going to be. Um, yeah. All right. So now let's talk about the section header table. So remember that this is necessary for the linking view, but not necessarily necessary for the execution view. Okay. So section header table. It's an array of section headers. So very similar to how the program header table is a array of program headers. The section header table is an array of section headers. Um, yeah, so what are sections? Um, oh, that's another thing, right? So if we go back to like the program header table, it's like a program, header program headers describe segments, but like segments are program headers, kind of. They just use two words for that for whatever reason, and they use them interchangeably. So, you know, just a little rant, but anyway. Section header table describes sections. Sections are not segments. Um, and sections are kind of like where all the important stuff is stored. So like, this is where all the assembly instructions for whatever the code is doing are going to be. They're going to be divided into sections. There's lots of them. And when you're doing reverse engineering type stuff, this is really where you want to look pretty much. Um, so those are sections. Section headers are structs that describe sections. So the general idea is that you have a section header table, which contains section headers. And the section headers contain all the sections. Makes sense. OK. So these are some common sections. Um, oh, god, that's a lot of text. <laughs> uh, yeah, the text section. Not to be confused with the text segment, which is in the text segment. OK? Um, yeah, that's the kind of documentation that you have to read for this stuff. None of this makes, you know, whoever named these things could have done maybe a better job. All right. So you have like the dot RO data section, which contains read-only data, PLT procedure linkage table. That one's going to be pretty important later on when we talk about dynamically linking. Um, you have you know stuff where global variables initialize global variables, and then the GOT PLT. That one's where the global offset table is. Um, that's also very important for when we get into dynamically linking. Just kind of remember that. And then various other ones for holding information regarding how to like you know do symbol relocation and link things and string tables for naming and like just this, yeah, there's a lot. Um, oh yeah, and then if you go like look at the last one, the string header table, string table. <laughs> um, yeah, this is actually pointed to by the E underscore string header string index thing, this guy, which um, is in the elf header, so like, when I said it's a roadmap and it gets referenced to other places, it's kind of what I meant. All right. So this is what the section header struct looks like. So your section, your section header table is just going to have a bunch of these structs. It's just an array of these structs. And those are all of its values. Again, similar to the, um, the program header struct, it's just going to have like where to find it, what, it, what its name is, um, info regarding like what kind of type it is. Uh, how big it is, whatever, that kind of stuff. Do, 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 do. So, and if you recall, I said it's helpful to think about sections um, in regards to like what segments they're in, and it's helpful to think about segments in regards to as what permissions they have. So a data segment has read plus write permissions, and the data segment is going to contain, not really, but sort of, the um, dot data section, that. Uh, PLT section, um, so the PLT, the uh, GOT table, and um, initialized global variables, which is .bss, and all the dynamic stuff. And the text segment is going to have everything else, and it's got read and execute permissions. So .text uh, section is in the text segment. <laughs> um, so you know, again, the .text section. Not to confuse the .text segment is in the text segment. Type shenanigans. And uh, yeah, the .text section is going to hold all of the actual instructions, like all the font assembly stuff that says, you know, do this. This is the program, how it executes. And it's got your variables. It's got the PLT thing. It's got the PLT, which we're going to get into later. Um, it's got all of the relocation entry type stuff. That's on the text segment. So yeah, 
it's helpful to think about sections in terms of segments and then think about the um, permissions that they have and why that's important. It just helps kind of tie everything together and make things make sense. Okay. So I also kind of felt like parsing this one in C. So this is how I did it. Um, other people do different things. I referenced like just, I straight up just looked at the, um, uh, the like the read elf tool is open source and you can just kind of peruse it and find how you want to uh, do these things. I did it a little bit differently because this just makes more sense to me. But um, anyway, this is how I was doing it. So you get a section header table from the elf header. Um, then you get it from the e underscore sh off field, which is the offset of the section header. You just grab that, and then you get the string table from the section header table using the um, sh string, the section header string index. Um, like turning these shortened words into full words is very difficult for me for some reason. <laughs> and then, yeah, you do that, you just dereference the file, right, with this thing. You dereference your file, you go to the section header table, then you grab it, and then you get this sh offset, right? That's gonna give you the string table. Cool. And then you iterate through the section header, header table with e section header num, which is like the amount of entries inside of the section header table. So you just iterate through them, and then you can grab them from the, you grab the name from the string table, because names are stored in the string table. And then you can get the address from the section header table. You just, you know, iterate through it all, and that will get you that, so I'm just curious to see. And it kind of, like for me at least, when you actually code it in C, it helps make more sense where everything is actually located and how to use the different um, parts of the ELF file in order to find everything and know where they're, they're at and how they link to each other. Okay. So this is what I meant by like the documentation sometimes can be a headache. We have the dot data section, the data section, not to be confused with the data segment, will exist within the data segment and contain data such as initialized global variables. That sentence took me like 10 times to read before it made any sense. Um, and then you have stuff like sections and segments, right? So this is the definition of segment, if you look at the English word. It's each of the parts into which something is or may be divided, okay? The alternative, like the verb, is to divide something into separate parts. Segment, okay. If we look at the definition of section, any of the more or less distinct parts into which something is or may be divided. That's awfully similar to this one, right? <laughs> the same word. They mean two different, oh, whoops. They mean two different things. Or should divide into sections. It's like literally the same word, but they use it twice to describe different things. So not helpful, but yeah, okay. Moving on. <laughs> Short little rant. Um, symbols. So this also kind of took a while to get my head around. Um, symbols are pretty much a way to reference code for like when you don't just have it yourself or in the file that you're working with. Um, so basically whenever you have a function that you're trying to pull from somewhere else or like even sometimes you know locally, it's gonna have a symbol for it. So like you can think of it as, um, did I put it in here? Okay, well symbols, they have like symbol definitions and there are like symbol values, right? So the function, like the symbol name for it is gonna be like the function name, right? But its definition is gonna be the actual, like what the function is doing. So it's used for functions, global variables mostly. So you'll have a symbol for each of those two things. And there are two symbol tables, and this is also kind of fun. You have the, the dynamic symbol table, which contains global symbols that reference foreign symbols, like libc functions, right? Whenever you compile something, you're not like statically compiling libc into it, um, but you're like, you know, linking it when you compile. And so it has symbols saying, okay, we need these functions, but they're over there, so we have a symbol for it, and we're gonna reference it by the symbol because we don't actually have that in our own file. And then we'll go into the relocation process and then how that all actually happens. But yeah, so that's what a dynamic symbol table has. And then the sim, this is like the sim table, the symbol table, it contains all the symbols in, dynamic symbol ta in the dynamic symbol table as well as local symbols defined in its own file. So it's like, why would you have um, the dynamic symbol table if you already have this one that just has everything in the other one, right? Well, it's because the, the dynamic symbol table is necessary for runtime. So 
it's like when you're actually, if you go and think all the way back to that first diagram, we have the execution view and the uh, linking view. Um, the simple table, the dynamic symbol table is necessary for when it's actually getting, um, when it's actually getting linked at, like when you're running it, when you're compiling it and running it. You need that dynamic symbol table to make sure that it actually knows where to find all those things. Um, the simple table you don't actually need. You can like get rid of it and it'll work fine unless, well, I mean, if you're just executing it, right? Um, yeah, it doesn't get loaded into memory. So the simple table though, what its primary use is for is like when you're debugging and reverse engineering, it like makes things easier to find. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So yeah, just wanna say another way to like think about this. Uh, actually, I think I had it later in here. Yeah, okay, anyway. Okay, so more symbols. That's the struct of a symbol. So now we're looking at like an ELF64 example, right? So the symbol tables are gonna have, like they're arrays of these structs. And uh, let's kind of get into these values of what the struct has. It's got a name, it's the ST name is just the offset to the symbol table string table entry. So it's gonna go to the string table entry and grab that name from there. Um, yeah, and it has other, it must be zero, and it does nothing. It, that's actually just what it does, it does nothing. <laughs> it just exists. Yeah, and they're like, we might need this for later, but it's been like 20 years and they haven't used it for anything. So it does nothing, it must be zero. Cool. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just there, yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, and it's pretty interesting too, because if you go on like Stack Overflow and like try to find these things, some people say, oh, it's actually for this, but they're just lying, like it's not. Okay, like people have different theories. I forget what I found, but like, it, no, it just doesn't do anything. Um, okay, yeah, this ST, the SHNDX, so every symbol is defined in relation to a section. This holds that relevant section header table index. So it'll go to the section header table and then grab that. Like it's it's the index of the section header that it's defined in reference to. Um, try to make that make sense. <laughs> um, it's got the value, which is the address or offset to the symbol's value. It's kind of like the location of it, sort of. And then it's got the size of how big it is, right? Cool. So symbols come in different types. There's a node type, which is just undefined. It's, yeah, just undefined. Um, and then you have the func type, which is, um, if it's a function or like an executable chunk of code, right? That symbol will be, you know, given the func type. An object is associated with a data object, so pretty much like global variables are gonna be of object types. And then symbols also come in different bindings, and bindings come into play when you're linking. So you have the local binding, which is the symbols invisible to outside files, and you see that when you have like static functions. Um, you have global bindings, which is visible to all object files that are getting combined. So if you have a bunch of like .o files, um, they're probably gonna have you know global bindings. And then you have weak, which is the same thing as global, but with lesser priority. So if like, uh, that right in there, yeah. So if another function has the same definition, but it isn't weak, then that one is gonna get used um, instead of this one, right? So, you know, just another kind of way of thinking about your functions when you're coding, it kind of, it's all starting to make sense now. So you can strip the simple tables and I, Talk about this because like from the reverse engineering perspective, it's kind of cool. And from the malware perspective, it's kind of fun. So when you want to make reverse engineers have a hard time, this is what you do, okay? You can use the strip command, which removes the sim tab table, which makes it a lot harder to, you know, look for your symbols. Um, but it's like, it's, it's fine, it's whatever, you know? You got like other, you got another symbol table. You still have your dynamic symbol table, which has all the important ones. But um, you can actually get rid of that too. So if you use, if you statically compile it, and that won't be there, or if you just don't use the standard library as well, um, there won't be any table because it's gonna be statically compiled. Okay, so fine, without tables, we can look at the procedure prologue to figure out where the functions start and where they end. The procedure prologue is just gonna be a couple of assembly instructions that like prepare that function. It's gonna push the base pointer 
and then move the, uh, the stack pointer to the base pointer, right? And then sometimes it like subtracts a number or whatever. But uh, you can get rid of the procedure prolog. Well, you can like obfuscate it if you do f omit frame pointer. So you can do all these things to make it really hard to reverse engineer something. Um, yeah, so that's just, you know, good to note. All right, so now we're gonna get into relocations, which is like the purpose of symbols. Symbols exist so that they can be relocated. And this is where things get a little, a little more involved. We're not just like looking at structs anymore and talking about what they hold. This is uh, some, some time for some math. <laughs> okay. And yeah, I had to do this by hand last night and it was, it was an adventure. We'll get into it. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is the process of connecting symbol references with symbol definitions. So names to a face, right? That's how I like to think of it. The symbol um, reference, like what you're calling it, the name, and what it actually like is, the face, right? So if you use these analogies, it just helps, helps all this stuff make sense. All right, so yeah, so the relocation, relocations are like kept track of by relocation entries. And these relocation entries are inside of the dot rel, the dot rel, the, the relocation section, right? And they come in those varieties. You have elf32 rel, elf32 rel with a, elf64 rel, or elf64 rel a. The rel a's mean that there's like an explicit add end, and I'll get into that, but yeah. So they contain these three values, or sometimes two values, depending on what it is. You have the offset, which points to the location that requires a relocation action. So relocation action is gonna be like some really ugly math formula that you have to do to make the relocation happen. So, you know, like, hey, where do you need to stick this code? That's where the offset is pretty much saying. Um, the info, it gives the symbol table index for the proper relocation, so like the relocation that you actually need to use. It says, this is, it goes to symbol table index and says, hey, if you need this function, right, grab it from here, and that's where it's gonna get relocated. Well, that's what's gonna get relocated, as well as a relocation type. Then you have the add end. Now the add end is only present when you're using the, um, the L32 rel A or the L64 rel A. And it's a constant that is kind of used to compute, um, yeah, the value in the relocatable field. So if you think back to like this relocation action thing, this add-in is gonna be used in that formula in order to determine what offset the relocation needs in order to find the new symbol inside of the code. Um, yeah, so it's not used that often in L32 files for whatever reason. It's used a lot in L64 though, um, like the, the add-in that is. And if you see it, if, you're, if you see this, like if this field exists, R underscore add-in, and that means that you're working with an explicit add-in, it's like explicitly defined. When it's not present, then you use an implicit add-in, which is a bit simpler. It's just like implicit add-in is just gonna be stored wherever the relocation is called. And uh, the example that we're gonna use is gonna be the implicit add-in because it'll make the explicit one make more sense. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's do a relocation, right? Oh, actually, never mind. We're gonna look at what the structs look like. Yeah, I put that there. Let's go, okay. So that's what it looks like in C. Um, again, right, when you don't have when you're working with just rel, you don't have the add end. When you have this type, that means that you're using the explicit add end. You have this value over here, right? And just the same thing for 64, right? Okay, cool. So these are relocation actions. Those are all the wonderful mathematical formulas. And these are just the ones for 64. Like 32 uses different ones. Um, yeah, and then you have like the calculation is gonna be like some S plus A minus P, L plus A minus P, or these things, right? And those things are defined over here. It's no, there's like no point in memorizing any of this. If you ever need to do these things by hand, then um, first of all, you have my condolences. And uh, second of all, just like reference this, okay? Don't bother trying to memorize this at all. It's not worth it. So yeah, and then over here, I just kind of put like what those things are. So A is the add end. Remember how I said you might need that. And when you do these calculations, and I'm pretty sure they all, well, they don't all have them, but most of them use the add-end. And then you have other ones. The ones that we're gonna use for our example, it's gonna be A, the add-end. Um, I'm gonna talk about L a little bit because Rudolph wronged me and told me I needed it, but I didn't. Um, so yeah, it's the section offset or address of the procedure linkage table entry for a symbol. So for the symbol that you're trying to relocate, it's like 
This is going to be the PLT entry for that symbol. Um, I'll get into what that means. And then uh, S and P are also good to note. I'm going to be using those in our example. So S is the value of the symbol whose index is in the relocation entry. So just the location of the method that we're trying to relocate, really. And then P is going to be the uh, section offset or address of where the simple definition is being relocated, so where we want to put it. And you calculate this by saying, okay, what is the current symbol that we're in? What's the current method that we're in? And then you just add on the, um, the offset value from, the, from there, and you'll get that number. And this isn't written anywhere in the documentation. <laughs> okay, so, or if it is, and I just, I have not found it, and I have not found it, like, you know, properly explained. Okay. So we're going to do an example. I created two very simple methods here. We have def.c, like you know, our definition, where we're going to define a just you know a simple method called hi, and it's going to print hi wild. And then we're going to have caller.c, which is going to just run hi, but it doesn't have the hi method in there, right? It's going to have to take that from definition.c. So we compile them as object files. So they're position independent code. They're shared. Um, they're just, you know, object files. Uh, you can do that with the text C parameter when you use GCC. Um, and that will create our def.o and caller.o, right? So now you have these two object files. And remember that caller is, is calling a method that's defined in define, right? It doesn't have it. So let's look at the example. I use read elf. And I have a tag car is just saying, okay, well, let's look at the relocation entries. And caller, okay, well, I named it caller 32 because I did two examples, one 32-bit, one 64-bit, but we're just looking at the 32-bit one because we don't have all day. Okay, so read elf, and we look at the, the relocation entry. The bottom one you see is our relocation entry for our high method. Now, remember, caller 32.0 doesn't have high method, so it has a relocation entry for it. And we see that an offset value is um, hexadecimal 1.4, which is 20 in decimal. Um, that definitely didn't trip me up. And uh, we get the type, which says R386 PLT32. Now, we use that type to determine what kind of, which one of these wonderful methods do we want to use. And if we look, it says L plus A minus P, right? That's the one, right? x86, 64, PLT, 32, L plus A minus B. That's the mathematical formula we need. So we need the add end, we need where we're going to be putting this thing, and we need its entry in the PLT table. Now, just like quickly, the PLT table is for like kind of dynamically linking things. So since this is statically linked, I was first wondering, why am I looking at the PLT, right? And I'll get into that because, uh, believe it or not, this was wrong. Read Elf kind of lied to me, okay? I did this math for like many hours. And I looked at the PLT table, and there wasn't an entry for the high function, because why would there be? It's statically linked. So that threw me for a bit of a loop, because I had to use um, some like mild, just basic al algebra to find out what's the actual value I needed in order to um, get the offset that ended up being computed. And it wasn't the L value, it was actually the S value. So the actual method I needed to use was this one up here, S plus A minus P. Um, I don't know if read elf just kind of like got confused or, or what the deal was, but um, yeah, so interesting. <laughs> Not sure why that happened, but yeah, that's what I had to do. So let's, uh, let's do this, right? So first, yeah, we get the offset, offset. it's 14. Well, it's 20, decimal 20, x 14. And then let's find the, um, find the add end. We need that as well. That's the A in our formula. So we can do that by, um, you know, we use object dump to um, object dump in order to disassemble the thing. And we go to our main fu function to find where this is getting called. And we see here that the add end, uh, whoops. Spoilers, OK. So we see that the add end, you know, it's highlighted in that beautiful red box. Um, the add end is FF, 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 FC. Um, and E8 is just the opcode for, you know, the call instruction. And then we note here that we also see the offset is uh, hexadecimal 14, right? Which is, yeah, just, you know, verifying that we aren't crazy and that Rudolf at least was right in that regard. 
Okay. So add end, that's the implicit add end. Remember how I said earlier, if it's going to be explicit, then if it, okay. So if it was an explicit add end, then read elf would have told us here, would have been in the relocation entry. But since it's an implicit add end, it's not going to be there. So it's just right with the call instruction. Like it's just, it's right there included, right? So that's the only difference between if you're working with implicit or explicit add ends. Um, yeah. So now if we take a look at the fully compiled executable, right? So if I like took both of those, um, if I took both of those def.o and caller.o and I combined them together and I created this executable called relocated, then we look at that executable. And this is what we see, right? We see that at address 11AO, we call hi using offset um, 0E, which is 14 in decimal. So as I was you know, sitting there doing this algebra and writing these things down on paper, I had like 14 written in decimal and hexadecimal at the same time. And I very often lost track of which one was which because I just wasn't writing that down and keeping track of it. So that like added an extra silly hour of math at 2 a.m. Anyway, so yeah, we see that at that address we're calling high using that offset 0E. So 0E is what we're trying to calculate, right? Like we're trying to find out how did it get this hexadecimal 0E value in order to determine what you know, it needs to call this is like also called, there's like, they call it 10 different things the offset, but this is also called the offset <laughs> for what we're trying to find, okay? And uh, yeah, so the formula that we were used to get 14 in hexadecimal 0E, that thing, was S plus A minus P. So S, which is going to be the, uh, the address of the high function, like where that gets situated inside of our final, final, like, executable object, right, relocated, that final executable. That address, if we look, um, if we look over here, right, it says it there, or you can just continue scrolling through object dump and find that high is the, the method high, the function, its symbol starts at 11B3. So that's our S value. And then we add our add end, which is, um, you know, that big thing with a bunch of Fs and Cs. And important to note, when you convert that add end into an unsigned integer, it's actually negative four. And that's also not documented anywhere because this comes up a lot and you need to do that in order to actually make this formula work. So yeah, it's a, it's a good one to know. So we're basically taking this hex value then we're subtracting four from it. And then we're also subtracting, well, yeah, yeah, because, yeah, then we're subtracting P. And the way you calculate P, remember if, um, I said this a little bit earlier, you go to your current symbol, so our current symbol is main, right? That's the current method we're in. We're in the main method. The address of that is hexadecimal 118D. And then you add the offset that we found inside of the relocation entry, and when we just looked at the relocation entry for caller.o, which was hexadecimal 14 or decimal 20. And so you do that, and you actually get that value. And I was so happy with that when I found out that formula and how to get it working, because that took way longer than it should have. Okay. How much time? Really? Oh, buddy. <laughs> this goes. Okay, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll speed this up. Okay, that's relocations. That's how you do them by hand, and it's a painful process. Don't ever do it unless, like, you're trying to do something cool. Okay, dynamic linking. Um, linking on the fly. There are, oh, God. There are four main ideas here. You have the auxiliary vector, um, which we'll get into, and then you have the procedure linkage table. You have the global offset table, and the dynamic section. And the global offset table, GOT, Game of Thrones. I never read or Game of Thrones or watched it. But those things look like elves and they're in Game of Thrones, so I put them there. Okay, the auxiliary vector. Picture this. You are a program getting loaded into memory. You know, that happens with the six executive EE call, syscall. You are given like a stack, and that stack is set up in a particular way to give information to the dynamic, the, dy the dynamic linker, which is gonna link all this stuff. And the top of that stack is the auxiliary vector, or auxv, okay? So this is the auxiliary vector. It's an array of these structs, right? It sits at the top of that stack there. And it has a type and a value, okay? And these are the different types. Um, they, you know, just kind of, this gets fed into the dynamic linker to help it have the information it needs to link stuff. So those are the types, and then, those, and then the, uh, the value is just gonna be whatever it is, right? So if it's the entry, then the value is going to be the entry point of the program, and the type is gonna be AT entry, cool. 
Um, you can look at what they are by setting this environment variable to one whenever you run something. So I did it for ls, and then we can see the auxiliary vector for it. So yeah, these get passed to dynamic linker so that it knows things. Cool. Okay, so again, this is kind of the process of how this gets generated. SysXXVE gets called, calls that method, which calls the next method, which calls that next method, and then eventually it calls create elf tables, which will actually create the auxiliary vector. And if we go into the source code and look at like a little snippet of it, this is kind of what it does, right? It just has a type, it creates it, and then it references again the elf um, header to get these values, right? So cool that we see that coming, making a comeback. And then, yeah, that just gets self-ended in the linker. So the PLT JOT table, um, yeah, it's like the beginning of an example. I, yeah, okay, anyway. Uh, we can first object jump. We see that, okay, so if we're just using like a basic hello world program, I just I used hello world for this. It's just int main, hello world, right? Printf. Printf is what we're dealing with here. Printf is not defined inside of hello world.c. It's defined, like, printf is defined in somewhere else. So we object dump hello world, and we see that it's calling this thing. It's calling print at plt, okay? Uh, the address is 1050, is the, and is the plt entry for printf. All right, so if we dump the plt section, we go to 1050, we see that that's just a jump to this other place. So we jump there, then we jump to somewhere else. What's the deal? And yeah, we're jumping to the Game of Thrones entry point for printf, the global offset table. Um, however, the first time that this gets called, right, the thing is, we don't have an entry, a, a GOT entry address for that. We don't, we don't know what that is yet. This is called lazy linking, as opposed to strict linking. So, yada yada yada, pretty much, the first time we do it, we don't know what we're doing, but then we do it once, and then we keep track of it, and then we know what we're doing, right? That's what lazy linking is. Um, yeah, so this is like, I was going to do a full worked example of all this stuff, but I couldn't get it like all the screenshots I needed in an hour. So <laughs> I just kind of text dumped how this general process goes. You're going to call printf. So you start with that call, right? You go to the PLT entry for that thing. The PLT entry does an indirect jump to the, um, the global offset table. The global offset table has the address of the, it goes back to the PLT to it, and it then pushes the instruction onto the top of the, geo, of the GOT, the global offset table. And then, uh, Push instruction, okay, where, where was I? <laughs> okay, well basically, you, from the PLT, you go to the GOT, then GOT goes back to the PLT, then PLT pushes this thing, and then it pushes this other thing, which is the first entry of the PLT, and it says, this is the link map struct, okay, which is actually the second entry in the GOT table for printf. And then we jump, the last instruction in the PLT entry is this jump to this runtime result thing, which adds a symbol value, aka the memory address of printf to its corresponding GOT entry. So now it's just always there. And whenever we run um, printf, we're just gonna jump directly, the PLT is just gonna take us directly to where that gets defined instead of doing this whole thing. So that's lazy linking. If you wanna see an actually like, good example where this guy walks through it, um, I found this one YouTube video, and yeah, like, it's actually not full of BS, and it actually makes sense. So um, yeah, I agree with that. Um, yeah, then you have the dynamic segment, which is yada yada yada, the dynamic segment is used to, uh, it's like referenced by the section header and program header because it's needed for linking. And it just kind of helps the dynamic linker make decisions and things and know what stuff is. It's the first, um, like the first entry in the, um, the offset table is the address of this thing. And then here are the, the different like entries, the different types of entries for dynamic segments. Um, yada yada yada. Here are the resources for this thing. And I already took way too much of your time. I apologize. But um, yeah, these are the resources I use. These ones are actually pretty good. So, oh yeah, and also a lot of random videos and blog posts that I'm sure we're hopefully not at all just doing whatsoever, totally. And yeah, that's it. Are there any questions? What's up? Um, Kind of both, but yeah, this stuff, like if you're doing any kind of uh, writing viruses or there's a lot of elf injection techniques and where this stuff is really handy to know. Like there's this, I didn't put it in here, but uh, there's this tag in the dynamic section. It's like DT debug. And some guy found out that you can just like inject a random object file into there and make it like and just include arbitrary code into an elf file by doing that. Similar with your locations. You can just like 
find ways to kind of finagle with the relocation table to include your own arbitrary code for your own symbols and stuff. It's like you can do a lot of really cool evil things with this knowledge for sure. Any other questions? No, thank God. <laughs> All right. Thank you.